folks how are you doing and thanks so much for being patient we're off to a late start I had technical issues it's my first ever youtube live so i had to learn about encoders setting up encoders in the last six minutes however we're here right so the purpose of today's chat is about um norse dragon slayers and a particularly unknown myth anywhere apart from the north of scotland known as assy paddle and the stoor worm now the best way to do this is for me to actually tell you the myth before we get into the interpretation of it but it's truly the interpretation of the myth that's going to provide the value in what we're going to talk about here essentially we're going to look at the hero's journey narrative the underlying structure of every movie that's ever been told from harry potter to the bible and from star wars to the holy books of um, the ancient vedic hindus so to start with i'm going to give you the myth in my own words and then what we're going to do is we're going to um we're going to go through the jungian archetypes we're going to go through the hero's journey of joseph campbell then we're going to look at the environmental and the astronomical conditions within the myth and see what we can take away from all that because essentially we are the heroes that you're about to hear about so assy paddle and the stoor worm assy paddle was a poor farm boy who came from lee garth in orkney he was born of six brothers and a sister there were seven of them now while the brothers were known as hard working farm boys assy paddle was a lazy bastard he was a sloth. The name Assy Paddle means fire raker. So he was known for playing in the ashes beside the fire. And as lazy as he was, one thing that Assy Paddle was known for was stories. He used to make up fabulous myths where he featured, featured as the dragon slayer and the hero in his own legends. <clears throat> now, for some time, darkness had spread across the land. A great beast sent from the depths of hell, known as the Meister Stoorworm, the Master Stoorworm, had shadowed the land for months. Now, the Meister Stoorworm, when it was hungry, it would drag in entire hillsides, crush castles, and eat farms. So the village people gathered to decide what to do about this apparently undefeatable monster. The villagers decided to consult the local spaman, the magic wizard from the mountains. And the wizard came upon the people and told them that the way to conquer the beast's hunger to stop him eating the farms would be to feed him seven maidens every Saturday. And that unfolded horrifically. And every Saturday, seven maidens got delivered to the beast. It would stick out its two-pointed tongue with throngs and pull the maidens in, throw them back without even chewing them. So this was becoming a problem. And all the way, Assy Paddle was fantasizing about maybe he would become the hero that would defeat the stoor worm. So the king had a realization one day that if any more maidens were delivered to the stoor worm, there wouldn't be any more females in the kingdom to marry the men it would be genealogical destruction if you like so he consulted this spaman again who said what else can be done to appease the hunger of the beast so the wizard said the only way to satisfy a creature that had eaten the whole way around the world because of course the meister stoorworm was so large that it circled the world and bit its own tail would be to feed it the sweetest and most precious food in all the land the princess Jem the Lovely herself. Now, this idea horrified the people. No one could even dream of having Jem the Lovely put to death. However, the king declared that for they were from the lineage of Odin himself, that the princess would die to save the people and the land. So that night, the king came to Asi Pavel's father, and he was talking about his subplot, his plan, there was no way he was going to let the beast devour his daughter. So he put a call out across the land to any valiant knight who might come and save his princess daughter, who might defeat the Meister Stoorworm, that he would give not only his princess's hand in marriage and all, but also give them a snapper, headed from Odin himself. 
36 valiant would-be heroes turned up to win the hand of the princess, the land and the magic sword. But after seeing the stewer worm, they all ran in fright. That night, before the princess was put to death, Assy Paddle came to thinking. Assy Paddle, the fire raker, lifted a glowing peak from the fire and put it inside a metal pot and inside his leather bag. And the next morning, before the king set sail to take on the beast himself, Assy Paddle boarded his father's horse, the quickest horse in all the land, Go Swift. He charged to the coast and he got to the harbour before sunrise. He boarded the king's boat. And before the king could awake, Assy Paddle set his rudder and his sails into the deeps of the ocean. And there he set sail into the abyss. Assy Paddle went for the stewerworm himself. Now, when he got to within sight of the stewerworm, the myth records that the beast had a head the size of a mountain with two eyes like black locks. And Assy Paddle knew there was nothing that he could do. And there was no weapon on this earth that could defeat the beast from the outside. So Assy Paddle waited till sunrise. And when the beast made the first of its seven yawns, the ocean got sucked to within the belly of the beast at which time Assy Paddle pointed his sails towards the mouth of the beast. And on the second gulp, Assy Paddle got sucked into the Meister's stir worm. And Assy Paddle went into the dark caverns in a place unknown. And after what seemed like endless times getting sucked past the gills where the water was being flooded out, he went down the esophagus, he went down the ridges, and into the internal world of the Meister Stewerworm, where his boat finally reached dry land or stomach lining. So Assy Paddle started exploring the caverns. He started exploring the darkest recesses of the beast. And just when he thought all hope had been lost, he stretched into his bag and pulled out his pot. And inside his pot was the glowing ember. Assy Paddle had started several fires using fish liver oil. And having located the liver of the Meister's stir worm, he plunged the ember into this liver of the stir worm. And he blew on it. And he blew in it and blew in it repeatedly. And it was almost gone out with the humidity of the beast. But eventually, he saw a light. He saw a flicker, a flame of hope. And he blew and blew and blew. And eventually, the stir worm began to rise. So as he paddled, bolted back to his boat. He got onto his boat. And as the stir worm coughed, the boat got thrown into the sky, out of the belly of the beast and into the light of the day. And the boat landed firmly on the beach as he paddle was once again amongst his people. And as the stewerworm writhed in the air, it cast out its double forked tongue and gripped the moon, but it was too wet. So it slid on the horns of the moon, smashed into the ocean, separating Danes from Norway and, Den and um, Switzerland. The teeth of the beast landed north of Scotland and formed the islands of Orkney, Shetland and the Faroes. And finally, when the beast was about to die, it curled up and bit its own tail once again and formed Iceland, where still today you can see the volcanoes and the geysers, the smoking ember that Assy Paddle left in the darkest recesses of the belly of the beast. Now, one would think that that would be enough for any man to conquer. We've got the story of zero to hero right there. But as every movie that's ever been produced in Hollywood and produce, um, knows, every dragon has to be slayed twice. So Assy Paddle married the fair princess. Assy Paddle inherited the lands from the king. And Assy Paddle received Sicker Snapper Odin's magic sword. 
but before peace could be brought to the land, after the dragon, the external beast had been conquered, there was one last challenge for Asipadal, for word had reached him that the queen had been having an affair with the magician, the spaman, the wizard of the hills. And the advice that they had given the people to feed the princess to the beast was a way of getting rid of an inheritance problem. The wizard planned on marrying the queen. The princess was a block. So upon finding out this news, Assy Paddle had to go and face the wizard. And as he charged into the forest after um, Princess Jem de Lovely and the wizard, the wizard turned and came straight back towards Assy Paddle holding his magic staff. The wizard was confident knowing that there was no man on this planet could fight the magical forces and powers of such a powerful wizard. However, he didn't know that Assy Paddle had sticker snapper Odin's sword, which he simply thrust into the wizard like butter with a hot knife. The wizard died. Assy Paddle returned to his people as the hero, the saver of the land. On the material and on the inner scale, he truly had become the serpent biting his own tail and had restored peace and harmony to the land. And of course, they all lived happily ever after. Great. So now we have the myth of Assy Paddle and the Stoor Worm. So what does it all mean? Where do we even start with such a such a tale, such a multifaceted tale with so many components and so many aspects? Well, like any myth, the way to interpret such a thing is to, to address it from three principal or fundamental angles. That is the psychological, the environmental, and the astronomical, which you will find in most myth, most myths all come to a perfect wholeness within the structure of the myth. So first of all, to address the psychology of the myth, we would address the works of Dr. Carl Jung. Carl Jung um, first coined the term archetypes. And by, you know, the word archetypes, what he referred to were Emotional and environmental circumstances that appear within world myths, religions, folklore, and legends that are found concurrent and repeated. For example, the hero appears in ancient Greek myths, Norse myths, and Native American Indian myths. The tyrannical father, the trickster, who appears in um, as Loki in Norse myths. These archetypal characters are psychological states of being according to Jung, are threaded into Norse myths, are threaded into world myths. Because, according to Jung, the human mind was made up by self, the island of self, which was shrouded, if you like, by ego or persona. According to Jung, the I, the ego, was in constant conflict with self, which was the myth, the culture. The culture or myth within us is constantly driving us, calling us to action, calling us to become our truest potential, where the ego is constantly telling us to live out the predetermined safe patterns that were given to us in our childhood. So within a myth, whether it's in China, Japan, native North America, the underlying structure is exactly the same because the underlying emotions within human beings at all parts of the world are the same. Within the um, psychological components of Asipatl and the Stoor Worm comes the classic hero's journey as described by Joseph Campbell in the 1960s in his seminal mythological work, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, Campbell described what's known as the monomyth, the classic journey from child to adult, from life, birth, life through death. It appears in every movie you've ever watched. 
And I can give you an example of the mom to look at it in the ASI paddle mill. Listen to this. Let's talk about Star Wars and let's talk about Harry Potter, two completely different movies, two completely different genres. So let me give you an, outlo an outline of Star Wars. An orphan is brought up in a safe and ordinary place, has a call to action, his family stop him going. He eventually goes on an adventure, he goes into the heart of the empire, finds himself, comes home, brings peace and knowledge to all of the land. Harry Potter is from an ordinary and safe place. He gets a call to adventure. His family hold him back. He seeks uh, an otherworldly mentor. He too meets a bearded guide who takes him to an adventure. He goes into the heart of magic, the heart of Hogwarts, comes back, shares his peace, and is in a knowledge with all the land. So too did Asi Paddle, the ordinary cool stoker, the fireboy, get a call to action. And instead of living by the predetermined notions of his bully brothers, being the youngest son, he lived that which he was fantasizing about. He became the hero within his own life and set out to conquer the monsters within his own head. And this is where the mythological hero comes directly into each and every one of our individual lives. If we take on the hero archetype and so too go into fix and tinker with those demons and dragons, those jealousies, envies, and negative emotions which hold us back, which altogether constitute the mythological dragon, only then when we're in that belly of the beast, the gut of the whale as it was depicted in the Bible when Jonah went on a similar journey as Asi Paddle, and again was mythologized in the story of Pinocchio when he too went to the belly of a whale to realize and become a true boy or a real adult. So the hero's journey defined by Joseph Campbell setting upon archetypes of Carl Jung allow us to see the to interpret the acipadal myth as a thing of beauty now to give you an example of that what i'm going to do is read you a shortened version of this myth as interpreted under jungian and carl's and um, Joseph Campbell's systems. Asipatl's journey began in a fear-filled and highly repressive ordinary world where a call to adventure led him on his hero's journey. A supernatural aid archetype was reflected in the king twice consulting the spamen who helped Asipatl cross the first threshold before being sucked into the beast's mouth. While he was in the belly of the whale, as all archetypal heroes do, he tinkered and sorted out his childhood emotions, that which held him back from evolving as the hero and crossing back through the fresh threshold into adult life. So within the psychological components of Asi Paddle, you have the classic journey that all of us have to take, the, the, the one that takes us from not only the physical place we were born, but the the emotional structure that we struggle to evolve from as we grow up. And there's not one of you watching this that can say they've got no fears. And the people that do have fears, according to Carl Jung, are those people who don't have an open dialogue between ego and self or the myth. Because when you've got those heroes calling, those journeys, those adventures, potential mindscapes, landscapes, and pools of learning out there, out with your day-to-day -day job or out with the the thing that you spend most time doing, you're, you, there's an, a lack of synchronicity there between that calling and what the ego is allowing you to do. And most people just conform to the ego and um, repress the hero's call. Now, according to Jung, when the hero's call is repressed, everything which one desires or passionately and truly wants in their life that they turn against or don't actively seek to get goes inside and becomes part of what's known as the shadow. And of course, if you live a life rejecting your inner desires and not aligning with your beast, not harmonizing and having your inner serpent bite its own tail, bringing black with white, good with bad, and light with darkness as a whole, that conflict and that shadow will dominate one. And that's why people turn into utter wankers in their 40s and 50s when they've not taken the selfless time 
to do a little hero's journey and get rid of the things that end up making them angry wanks. Right, so moving on from the psychological aspects of Asi Patel, are the environmental archetypes within myths? For Jung didn't just look at the psychological, he looked at the environmental. In the Jungian um, interpretation of the mind, there were, the, the self was not only enclosed by ego, but there were two components, the anima and the animus representing our inherent female and male emotions or drives. But there was also the concept of the unconscious. But to Jung, that came in two components, the personal unconscious, which was all of our drive since we've been born, if we were bullied in school, whether we had lots of sexual intercourse, teenagers, whether we didn't. Those personal experiences and drives make our personal unconscious, where the collective unconscious, that seems to transgress race, creed, national boundaries. The collective unconscious is the, how could you best explain it? A good example would be the global fear of snakes and spiders. For hundreds of thousands of years, everybody around the world lived in caves, forests, and jungles. And we all saw our children and our parents dying through being bitten by serpents and by spiders. So there's an archetypal fear from the collective unconscious that creates such a fear. It runs much, much deeper than snakes and spiders. However, the environmental aspects of Asi Paddle come from the collective unconscious. The, the, this Meister Stirworm, with its smoke coming from its nose and its ability to tear entire agricultural hillsides into the sea and crush castles, is a reference essentially to chaos, to the chaotic environment, to everything that wasn't the summer, to the fall, to the waters, to the freezing blizzards and snows of the winter where cattle, people, and crops died. The Meister Stirworm is the dark months. And that brings us to astronomy and the astronomical archetypes, which synchronize perfectly with the environmental. Here we go. Now we're deep mining. We're at the proper belly of the beast in the Asipatl myth. It is no coincidence that Asipatl killed the beast, destroyed the darkness, the peat with the glowing ember. He didn't use a sword, although there was a magic sword. Odin's magic sword was available to him. No, no. He used a glowing peat. The glowing peat that Asi Paddle fought so, so hard to keep alive is representative of the sun at the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere when the day is at its shortest on the 21st of December. The idea of this smallest flame of light, the sun in its shortest day, being inserted into darkness and having to be blown three times, the three days of the solar standstill at the solstice. The darkness being conquered and light and order prevailing across the land. It is an absolutely astoundingly beautiful, calendrical, astronomical, environmental, and psychological myth. Told in eight paragraphs is the history of the Norse struggle with the seasons, the battle with darkness, the struggle to farm and to exist and to survive. Not only that, but these myths come from a world before organized formal religions. They come from a world when man was believed. Uh -uh. They come from a world where people were believed to come from the earth, like serpents, before uh, we came from the sky. So in these earth-based myths, Armageddon, apocalyptic turns and chaos across the land were represented by beasts. But so too was that chaos, the dragon serpent archetype used to represent the beasts in our mind, which so too hinder our growth 
and continued survival. So within classic mythology, like the Arthurian legends, where it's said that Arthur and the land are one, where Asi Patel became the king of the land, becoming one. What we have is a reflection of the actual Oribus, the snake biting its own tail, which to Young was the principal symbol of all alchemy. It in, represented the, the, the coming together of the ego and the self, the individualization of one's consciousness, according to Young. The coming from seed to plant, from tadpole to frog, and from breath to storm, a perfect representation of the cyclic time that the Norse cultures lived in. For today, we live in linear time, celebrated with birthdays, celebrated with death, and celebrated with anniversaries. But back in the day, when these myths were created, they lived in cyclical time where everything happened at once and not at all. So, we're going to pull ourselves right back out of the belly of the beast and come back to ground zero. And we're going to do what all good heroes do, and that is take the call to adventure, cross the threshold into the other side, confront your biggest and inner most darkest fears, emerge through the conflict, having become made welcome to your inner self. Amalgamating that as much as you possibly can with ego and getting on with it, but just not, not following the path of the ego without consideration of the myths, because it's in the myths that the call to adventure comes. And the ego is deaf to it, terrified of it. So, see you on the journey. And I'll see you next week. In fact, I'll see you on Sunday because we've got another one just like this. Thanks for tuning in.